there was a lovely study done by McDonald's that showed for one week, every family that came in to the McDonald's location received a balloon for each of the kids. Half of them got the balloon as they were leaving as a gracious thank you for frequenting our, our restaurant, right? The other half got the balloons as they came in. They got the balloons first. Those parents bought 25% more food. Now, Robert, you had a very close relationship with Charlie Munger, who passed away on November 28th of last year. And in a post you wrote, I have never had heroes except for Charlie Munger. So I was curious to start this interview off, if you could tell the story of how you met Charlie and what led to him reading your book, Influence, for the first time. My understanding of how he got a hold of it is he told me that a trusted confidant of his, an informant of his, had read the book and sent it to him and said, you really need to take a look at this. It's not about finance. It's not about e econom uh, economics, but it, it's about human behavior. And that allows us as analysts and investors to do a better job of predicting human behavior and making, uh, making choices uh, that benefit from that knowledge. Uh, so that's how he got a hold of it. And then uh, this was uh, a while ago, back decades now. And um, I then went to my mailbox, uh, knowing none of this, and found a legal-sized envelope, and I opened it, and there was a single share of Berkshire A stock in there with a note from Charlie Munger, someone I had heard of, of course, and but never had any contact with. And it's, he said, in your book, Influence, your principle of reciprocity, which is that we, we are obligated to give back to those who have first given us, right? Compensation in return. That's the way the world should work. Well, your book has made us so much money at Berkshire. You're entitled to this in return. And it was uh, a, a share of uh, stock. It was about $75,000 uh, at that time. Well, if you're up on uh, the, this morning's uh, stock market, you know that it's over $600,000 now. And uh, yes, the best financial decision I've ever made is to hold on to that share. I like to talk more about reciprocity there. Munger and Buffett had said that they had made so much money using this principle where other people feel obligated to pay back. It's like they're indebted when they've been given something. So are there any examples that come to mind for you where Buffett and Munger, they've used this principle of reciprocity in order to, you know, benefit others, but also enrich themselves? They do something you, you see that's very rare in uh, the business world, and that is they tell people, and they feel it that it's their obligation to tell people how they made their money, the strategies they use, the approaches they use, the values that they adhere to in order to ac acquire this kind of wealth that they, they, they have achieved. And they give that first. They give that out. So often, what you find is people being very proprietary about the ways that they got to success. What Charlie always told me is that it's, it's the obligation of people who have done well to show others how to do well. That way we have a better functioning and a happier and a wealthier society because we, we spread the, the information of how to operate within that society in ways that benefit all concerned. So I think that's the, the thing that they're talking about, giving information, uh, giving steps and, and procedures that have allowed them. Also, what they do is to give information about mistakes that they've made. They tell us when they have 
made an error and how they have then acted to prevent that from occurring again. I saw an article that showed that companies in their uh, annual reports that describe a loss as um, something beyond their control. It was weather conditions or it was an unexpected strike at a manufacturing plant or something associated with the uh, supply line disruptions and so on. The COVID, you know, when, when they do those kinds of things versus those people who describe a, a, a negative outcome and attribute it to something inside the company that went wrong. We didn't staff correctly. We didn't properly um, think through this, uh, this uh, initiative that we started. Right? Those companies that assign the problem to themselves have significantly higher stock prices a year later. Because observers say, oh, this is fixable. This isn't beyond their control, and they're on it. They're, they're working to create. This is what the, what, uh, you know, the, the, the people uh, at Berkshire do, uh, what Warren and, and Charlie do. They, they say, we, we messed up here. Here's, that will never happen again. Because we will never do that again. We'll never pay for um, uh, an acquisition with our shares. No, we're not going to do that anymore. Right? And, and uh, the other thing is that's interesting is uh, Warren does this. Um, he likes making those admissions very early in his annual report. First or second page of what went wrong. That structure's for the observer, for the, the reader, something else that's a powerful principle of persuasion. These are credible sources of information. If they will tell us honestly of what they did poorly, then I want to listen when they tell us what they did well, because that's going to be honest too. They're not pulling any blankets of positivity over our eyes when they tell us about uh, good choices they made because they've established themselves as honest sources of information by we being willing to talk about their their failures. Now we believe them more. You know, there's a there's a wall of incredulity between uh, a messenger and uh, a recipient of the message. Right? That, to what extent should I believe this person? Right? And one of the things that tears down that wall is trust is evidence of trustworthiness. And both Charlie and, and Warren have that in spades, and they're not only brilliant financial analysts and investors, they're brilliant communicators about how good they are <laughs> as financial investors. They make us register the the truth of what they're recommending by first showing us their credibility. I mean, it's just brilliant and rare. <laughs> That's right. I think you're on the dot on the point of pointing out your mistakes. Even decades later, uh, you mentioned the point of issuing shares that brings to mind uh, Dexter Shoe. I think it was 1992 where that investment definitely did not go well, but it's been mentioned many, many times and it, it hasn't faded away from his memory and he makes sure it hasn't faded from uh, his uh, the memory of his partners either. And there's something to that that really builds trust. And I think it really develops something where when you see these guys, you know what you're getting. They're not trying to hide anything and uh, you know exactly how they're performing. They're going to tell you how it is. And even in their best years, they're very quick to point out their mistakes of the past, but I wanted to turn back to Charlie here. You've stated that Charlie was a capitalist to the bone, but he advocated for a rarefied form, which was inclusive capitalism. I'm very curious to hear what this term inclusive capitalism means to you. It was another thing that impressed me to my core about him. He said, 
to me once. The reason, the one major um, rationale for accumulating wealth is to have it available for those people who don't have it in times of trouble. So it's not self-aggrandizing. It's, it's not the idea of I accumulate wealth for my own purposes, for my own ego, whatever. It's no, to have it available and to include others in those resources. That's a rationale for generating it in the first place that is so entirely morally responsible and commendable. You know, it's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great indication of how Charlie thought about uh, succeeding. He wanted to have the wherewithal to help others succeed in times of trouble when they were in a predicament. Speaking of including others, it was brought to my attention that you were a house guest for Charlie and Nancy a number of times. And Charlie had this way of, you know, not only sharing with the world at the Berkshire meeting and bringing in tens of thousands of people into uh, this arena, but there's many times I've seen pictures of, you know, he'd invite guests to his house to have dinner and, you know, have small gatherings and just share uh, what he's learned throughout his life. And even just before his passing, I know he was doing this exact thing. You know, he was uh, bringing people together and just surrounding himself by uh, people he really liked. So maybe you could talk about some of those personal interactions you've had and maybe some of the things you've learned uh, in those interactions. Well, that, in that particular situation, uh, he was going to be giving a major address at Caltech. And he invited me as his guest and asked me to come and spend uh, the night before at his place. And I have to tell you, that was intimidating. Uh, not the surrounding, it wasn't some palatial mansion. It was a very wonderful and beautifully uh, um, furnished, uh, plenty of great artwork and so on around. But it was intimidating because there I was on, on the home grounds of this man who was... Uh, uh, a mentor to me, a hero to me, and um, so I, I was. I was always walking on uh, on a thin ice. I thought, you know, I had to do everything right to make every change. <laughs> they they had me stay in a, a a beautiful guest room, and I don't know. I didn't even want to ruffle the the covers. You know, I didn't want to mess anything up. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how do I sleep without touching. <laughs> the sheets, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, so we we then went to the address and we talked about uh, things that we both recognized uh, would be important in uh, human behavior and making uh, choices that lent themselves to uh, final good decisions, right? And we both hit upon in a conversation on the drive over there, the importance of considering the opposite of what you are intending to achieve. That is, always think, now what would happen to us if this doesn't work? What would be the damages right, associated with that mistake? And be sure you've recognized them because it might not work. Nothing's certain. This might not work. And you have to think about not just what the uh, enhancements would be if it did work to your life. What would be the problematic aspects that would uh, apply if it didn't? And sometimes if you haven't thought about those, you're making a judgment that is incomplete. You haven't really thought it completely through. And I remember that, that ride uh, and that conversation is uh, very important to me because he's right. When I would make a choice, I would think mostly about the benefits, the advantages that would accrue if it was uh, a successful, if it was a good choice, not about what uh, the damages that might accrue if it, was, uh, if it went south. 
that was one thing. Uh, I remember another thing that he said. He was he was talking in his afterwards. There was a Q and A, uh, and he was talking. He kind of pointed to me and he he said, "You know, there's this principle of uh, commitment and consistency," and this is inherent in another mistake that we often see people make when they have a favorite approach. Uh, a favorite uh, way of doing things or a particular tool that they want to advance. And he said, you know, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this saying, uh, when you're committed to a, a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, right? <laughs> and he pointed to me and I, and I said, uh, yeah, and the more you've paid for that hammer, the more nail-like the world appears. And that's the first time I ever made him laugh out loud where he leaned back <laughs> and, 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 and roared. But I, I think what he's recognizing is that we, there are, we can get trapped by, by certain kinds of commitments that we make, right? And we really have to vet them fully before we go all in with uh, those kinds of commitments. Just to link this to sort of an example, what, what is a common kind of pitfall of this commitment and consistency bias that people fall prey to? Yeah, it's the idea that because you've put a lot of money into something, you don't want to get out because you're, you, that will be a loss, right? Even though all the signs are you're going to continue to lose unless you get out, the fact that you have made that initial commitment causes you to try to make it work somehow or through wishful thinking, try to conjure a way that you can make the, the, that the situation will improve. That's a, that's a really a mistaken um, way of thinking of, of, of uh, working through uh, decision making. Yeah, you've got to disengage from that commitment when the evidence is clear that it is not going to rescue uh, you uh, down the line. This reminds me of an example you included in your book on the chapter on commitment and consistency, and it was related to Amazon. This was probably before they were presumably having issues with labor shortages in 2022, but Amazon used to have a pay to quit program for their, empl their employees. And they would actually gift their employees who decided to leave the company up to $5,000. And the longer you stayed, the bigger the incentive bonus was. And publicly, Amazon said that they wanted people to work at Amazon who actually wanted to be there and actually be doing the job uh, they were put to do. So it was sort of a filtering mechanism. But you actually made the claim that the commitment and consistency bias was also at play in the pay to quit program. So could you talk more about that? Yeah. So what it, in fact, uh, Jeff Bezos even admitted to it. He said, we, we want to give these folks the opportunity to leave us and even give them, uh, uh an incentive to, right. Uh, a considerable amount. Um, but we don't want them to leave. We want them to recognize that they don't want to leave, even at that level, because that commits them to the job. The idea that, no, this is what I'm choosing. And if you know the literature on organizational uh, uh, by dynamics, people are more productive the more committed they are to the to the work. So with this strategy, by the way, very few people ever took the, the deal. I mean, it's like less than 5% ever do, right? So you get 95% of people making a choice that commits them more deeply to their work and as a consequence improves their productivity. That's a good deal. You related this, uh, this principle to investing. And for many people listening to our show, uh, maybe they spend 10, 20, 40 hours researching a company before they end up putting 
any a significant amount of money in. And I'm curious to get your take on psychologically when we invest in a company, when we bet on a horse or put chips on red on the roulette wheel, whatever it is, psychologically, what is happening, you know, that makes us, you know, essentially everyone just sort of fall prey to this, this bias. Yeah, it's it. What we've been talking about is the, essentially the sunk cost fallacy. You know, the the more you've put into something, the more reluctant you are to admit to the error that you made a bad choice, that you are a bad decision maker. People don't want to believe that about themselves, and they don't want the people around them to see them that way either. Okay, I took this big loss. They they're m- more willing to hang on and hope that it will eventually um, succeed in ways that validates their decision-making. And that sort of keeps them from pulling the trigger when all the evidence suggests, no, you need to get out of this. This 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 isn't a good choice now, and it's going to be a worse choice uh, in the future. So you had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, how these principles sort of tie into how Munger and Buffett operate. And I find this aspect just so, so interesting because what you see is really what you get. And the shareholders know that there are no surprises or big surprises coming at least. And if there are big surprises, uh, they're going to be well known to all of their partners. And there's just something to me about this very ethical way of doing business that it's almost amazing to me that it worked as well as it did. Because, you know, I think about like a number of successful people, obviously there are uh, nuances and uh, everyone's different, but you look at a number of successful people and especially uh, very successful salespeople, they're pretty notorious for being the type of people you sometimes just want to run away from when you realize some of the tactics that they're using. But for Buffett and Munger, it's very much the opposite, where they've just attracted all these wonderful people around them. Um, many people in the audience, myself included, go to Omaha and uh, just absolutely love it. We're surrounded by uh, these like-minded people that just love tuning into what these two have had to say over many, many years. So maybe you could talk more about how these principles of influence tie into you know, applying these principles in a way that's ethical. Yeah, so in this, let's first talk about the idea of the perception in the eyes of your prospects or uh, colleagues or uh, customers, clients, that you are ex- uh, uh, ethical. It's, it's a remarkably positive lever for, ch- for change in your direction, in the direction of the recommendations or proposals that you're making to people. I, I speak, uh, I do public speaking these days, often to business organizations. And I was at a, a, a group of real estate uh, 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 investors and uh, salespeople, actually, some real estate salespeople. And, and uh, I was talking about the importance of if you're pre- presenting a case to somebody, you always have pros and cons. And the key, if you want to follow the lead of Buffett, Buffett and Munger, is to mention those, those weaknesses, those shortcomings in your case, early in your presentation, so that everything after that is perceived in, through, the, through the lens of, uh, oh, this person is a credible, trustworthy source of information. I can believe the positive things this person is saying. So I was making that case. And a hand goes up uh, in the Q and A period, and somebody says, "You know, I have competitors. They they bury those negative things. They never speak about them at all. And and if I'm the one who talks about them, and then, you know, I I'll accept your your view that that I can bridge to the positive ones. But by mentioning a negative one in the first place, I think I I would be at a disadvantage." So I said, well, look, if all the others are doing this and you're not, think about the reputation you would generate as being the ethical one. Being the honest one 
being the trustworthy one that people can deal with. That's gold. Don't fumble that away if you can generate it honestly. It's really short-term versus long-term thinking, right? If you're, you know, hiding the cons, really you're just trying to make a short-term sale. But if you're trying to build, you know, find that right customer that like, you know, truly needs that sort of product, then you can deliver value to them over a very long period of time. And that trust endures, you know, over time. And that's what you see in a lot of companies that focus on that long-term, like a Costco, like uh, Munger talks so often about. Clay, have you ever dealt with somebody who tricked you into a, a, a decision, a purchase, uh, or uh, got you to buy something uh, and then it was not at all what was claimed by this person, right? I had one example I, I was going to mention. I was uh, walking the streets in Miami and I had someone approach me and they asked me a question. Uh, have you ever had a poor experience in a hospital? And I said... Well, of course, I mean, like who hasn't, I, you, we all go to the hospital a number of times and eventually, uh, there's, there's something you might not, uh, like, or, you know, some sort of experience that's outside of your control. And then they proceeded to get me to donate to, uh, a hospital and, you know, donate to like a children's hospital. And it was like, oh, right after I uh, made the donation, I had realized I was just persuaded to make a decision. I didn't want to. You're tricked into it, right? Would you ever go back to to interact with that guy? Would you ever partner with that person? Would you ever want to do business with it? So that's the cost that comes, as you say, down the line. You know, there is that short-term hit, but you've, you've alienated, you've poisoned the water for future interactions if you're that guy. You know, you're not the honest guy. You're not the honest one, right? So I won't deal with them in the future, Yeah. And I think most of us are like that. One really fascinating aspect of your book is that one can read it and try and internalize all of these concepts related to influence and persuasion, but we can still fall prey to them because these, these ideas are deeply ingrained in a part of who we are and these biases. Can you talk more about that and you know how we can be more aware of these sort of tactics um, and not fall prey to these types of situations. Right. And this is really an important question. In fact, in my book, Influence, at the end of, you know, I, I have one principle of persuasion per chapter. I have, uh, you know, seven of these uh, universal principles of influence, and I treat them. And then at the end of each chapter, I say, how do you say no? when somebody uses this on you in an undue or unwelcome, uh, uh, unethical way. What do, you, what do you do? So uh, let's take the principle of scarcity, the one that says people want more of what they can have less of, right? That things that are unique or rare, uh, dwindling in availability, become more attractive to us, and we want them more as a consequence. Well, usually that works very well. Those things that are scarce uh, are leaving uh, our uh, our possibility of obtaining something that's valuable. We it makes sense to want to get those uh, unique uh, advantages or benefits and so on. Okay, well uh, the problem is when somebody counterfeits that information. Otherwise, living up to uh, a, a behavior pattern in which you seize those opportunities, where you're dealing with uh, true, truly uh, credible individuals or people who have given to you first and so on. Those things always make sense. They make for a better set of interactions with our partners, with our compatriots, our contemporaries, and so on if we live up to seizing those opportunities that are there. And I'll give you an example from scarcity. A while ago, I was uh, in a uh, appliance store, and I wasn't really looking for a TV, but I noticed there was a big screen TV uh, that was on sale. And I knew from reading uh, consumers' reports that this was a very highly um, approved and evaluated uh, set. 
So I was over there and I was reading some of the material that was uh, associated with it uh, underneath this, on the, on the table. And the salesman came up to me and he said, I see you're interested in this set at this price. I can, I can see why this is a great deal, but I have to tell you, it's our last one. And already I was, well, it's your last one. I started to get tense. And he said, yeah. And there was a woman who called a while ago who said she might well come in this afternoon to buy it. Well, they call me the godfather of influence, right? The, the guru of influence. 20 minutes later, I'm wheeling out of the store with that set in my cart. Okay, because, of, and I knew that it was the principle of scarcity that was being used on me, right? But what I didn't know was whether it was honest or not. I didn't know if that was really the last one or whether there were a bunch more in the stock room and they would just use this tactic to get people to buy and then they'd just replenish uh, the, uh, the spot with another uh, set. Uh, but I bought it uh, because... You know, I, I believe this guy. At least I thought, all right, this is a good enough deal. I, I, I want to seal the deal. But I wanted to know if it was true. So I went back the next day to see if there was another one of those models on the, uh, on the table. No, there wasn't. It was a blank space. So I was happy that this man told me it was the last one. If he hadn't told me, and I came back later that night to purchase, I went to think about it, and I said, no, I really want this. And I came back, and he said, oh, it's gone. It was our last one. And a woman from Scottsdale just came down and bought it. I would have been furious at him. What? It was the last one? And you didn't tell me about its honest genuine scarcity what's wrong with you man right so the key is i applaud people who use these principles on me if they're honest if they truly are uh, uh, accurate and they are representing the truth of whether it's truly scarce where there's uh, true authorities or are recommending it, whatever it, the, the principle might be. It's the people who are deceiving us by counterfeiting that information. Those are the ones we have to watch out for. So that's what I think we have to, we have to do. We have to look not just at the information. We, we have to see the extent to which the information as best we can tell, is honest. If we can't tell before we buy, we can do what I did. We can then experience it, or, and then if it falls short, if it really isn't what we expected or what we were told, then we can be aggressive and get online and review that place and that person negatively. We don't have to be passive victims of this. We can counter punch and reduce the likelihood that this sort of thing happens without penalties associated for the people who, um, who use these principles uh, unethically. Right. And it's just a good reminder of how, how much is in our own heads. Right. You know, someone tells you this is the last one on the shelf and there's going to be no more after this. And in your mind, it's like, oh, the perceived value of it just increase. And I can't help but think of when I was shopping for a house oh, five or so years ago and, you know, you're shopping around looking at different places and you kind of get interested in one and you're like, OK, I'm not going to make a quick decision here. I'm going to think about it, uh, consider if it's something I really want and then. Uh, you get that text from your real estate agent and says, oh, someone else is, is interested in placing an offer on that place. And it's like, huh, huh I wonder if, if that was the uh, honest deal, because he could be, you know, just, uh, just trying to spark more interest because he makes a commission on the sale. 
And it, the, the scarcity piece to me is just so fascinating because we, compared to decades ago, we just live in a world of abundance. You know, if something isn't available right now, we can likely go oftentimes go across the street or, uh, you know, just maybe wait until the, the next day. It's just, but it still seems to be so powerful. Yes. And I think the way to counteract uh, the idea that because there's a lot of abundance, we don't really have scarcity is to recognize that within those uh, available options, some are unique. Some give us uncommon and rare advantages. And those are still worth seizing, right? Even though there's plenty uh, around, what we want is the ones that have scarce benefits for us to acquire if we make those choices. To, to think about the pattern of, um, uh, of features. And it may not be that there's any one feature that this thing has that nobody else has, but it might be that this one has a suite of features that nobody else has, a combination of benefits that I can't get anywhere else. And that helps me make that decision to move forward based on the scarcity principle. What if in 2024, you got a little bit better every day? When you're learning a new language with Babbel, that's exactly what you're doing. And if Babbel can help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks, imagine what you could do in a full year. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Thanks to Babbel, I can start having conversations and order my food in Spanish at local restaurants when the situation allows. It's no wonder they've sold over 10 million subscriptions and that studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash WSB. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash WSB. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash WSB. Rules and restrictions may apply. From your experience, are there any businesses that come to mind that seem to be one of the best at using this principle of scarcity? You know, it's the luxury products. It's the ones that uh, have uh, very high prices and there aren't very many available in the first place. Or there are, when an automobile uh, company uh, has a, an exclusive model that is only available in a, for a certain time or for, in a certain number of, uh, of them. If you look at the research, it shows that customer appreciation of that model jumps up to the extent that it is not available. So Volvo did this a while ago with a, a special model and had that uh, impact. And Munger is also well known for popularizing the use of mental models and connecting the dots within these different disciplines. And he's also known for this term that ever since he started using this, it's, it just really stuck with me. It's the Lollapalooza effect. And this is when you combine a variety of forces and it creates an amplified result in the end. I'm curious to get your take on if the Lollapalooza effect applies in the context of the seven principles in your book in the way that Munger describes it. It does. When it's possible to see more than one of the principles applying to an offer, that elevates it. So a while ago, um, I was doing some consulting for uh, the Bose Acoustics Corporation, and they had a new product. It was called uh, the Bose Wave Music System, and uh, they represented it in their ads as new. Uh, new, you'll be able to gain new uh, uh, features and, uh, and simplicity and elegance and so on, and they weren't happy with it. 
uh, with the advertising program, even though it was better than any of their rivals and they had priced it attractively. So they asked me to come in and, and change their, their ad. And I took a look at it and I said, no, this is a good ad for Bose uh, uh, purchasers. They want this information that you're giving them. Uh, they're not spur of the moment, impulsive kind of uh, buyers. But I, I am going to ask you to change something at the top of your ad. Previously, it said new. Well, um, we know from the scarcity principle that people are more motivated to avoid losing something. That is something that they, they can't get anymore, the ultimate form of scarcity. Uh, they're more motivated to avoid losing something than gaining that same thing. So I would just like you to change the wording at the top of the ad from new to hear what you've been missing. Right. So now the idea is if you don't get this, you're missing something, you're losing something, which Daniel Kahneman's uh, prospect theory showed is twice as effective as just telling people what they are getting. Right? You don't, we don't want you to lose this. You, you don't want to forego uh, what this will provide. And that increased purchases by 45%, uh, that one change. Now, after that happened, the Bose uh, marketing people asked me to come in and talk about what other principles <laughs> there might be that I could tell them about uh, uh, besides scarcity. And when I got to the principle on authority, that people want to follow the lead of legitimate, um, credible experts on the situation, I saw lights going on uh, over the heads of these folks because by then they had several testimonials from experts, from true authorities in the area of um, uh, audio technology, right, R praising uh, this new product. So what we did was to generate yet a third generation of the, of the ad. This one said, hear what you've been missing at the top, but also had a, a, a column of, of quotes from uh, widely rec respected experts in audio technology, right? And that increased purchases by 60% compared to the first uh, generation ad. So you can put these together and produce Lollapalooza effects when there's a confluence of factors that all apply. I'm a great one from believing that, uh, of believing that when you see a big effect, a very large scale sea change kind of effect is almost never due to one thing. It's due to a conjoint um, unification of several things at the same time that are pushing in the same direction, and that accounts for the mushrooming kind of effects that you see in Lollapaloozas. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. And now, uh, whenever I visit some sort of sales page, I just can't help but think, point out, oh, there's that, there's that principle, there's that principle. And uh, I also can't help but uh, stay on the Charlie Munger path here. One of my very favorite quotes of his is, to get what you want, you need to deserve what you want. I'm curious on your thoughts on how this might tie into reciprocity and, and this quote here. The key of res for, re for implementing reciprocity is that you have to go first. You have to provide something to another, which causes them to want to give you what you deserve in return, right? So I think that's what he's saying. You have to go first. Really, you have to go first. Um, provide gifts, favors, services, information to people, not designed to improve your, the likelihood of... Uh, that they will see your offering as better, just that they will feel grateful for being the recipient of something that's designed to improve their outcomes and not to buy your product just in a general way. Um, and so um, 
there was a, a, a lovely study done by McDonald's that showed that if for one week, every family that came in to the McDonald's location uh, received a balloon for each of the kids. So half of them got the balloon as they were leaving as a gracious thank you for coming, uh, frequenting our, our restaurant, right? The other half got the balloons as they came in. They got the balloons first. Those parents bought 25% more food because they had received. So this is, the, I think, the essence of you have to go first to trigger the benefits of the reciprocity rule. And what Charlie's uh, quote uh, specified is exactly that. It's a great reminder when you have something you want in life, it's like, okay, invert it. Use that inversion principle of Munger's. What can I do first to sort of maybe lead to that outcome? So to have a good spouse, be a good spouse, to have a good partner, be a good partner. You know, you should lead to uh, try and bring that outcome. You know, if you if you if you're intending to try and bring that outcome on the back end. That's right. There's so much wisdom there, and it's a reason why in every human culture, we are trained from childhood in this rule: you must not take without giving in return. You must not take. We have very nasty names, don't we? for people who take without giving in return, who we then avoid. We call them moochers or takers or ingrates. So we don't want to deal with those people uh, as a consequence because it's so beneficial to the larger community, to the larger society, to have people cooperating and exchanging goods and favors and services with one another. And one of the sort of aha moments for me in reading this chapter in your book is that uh, this tactic can be really tricky when other people are using it because you don't control two things. So the first thing you don't control is what people are giving you. And then the second thing you can't control is what they're potentially asking from you later. So you're, you're receiving your gift. You're like, oh, now I have to, you know, you feel indebted to them and you have to give, give on to them. Yeah, right. And so that's another one of those things that we talk about at the end. So if you see that this was designed as a device, it was a, you know, an artifice. It wasn't a true gift. It was designed to get you to do this thing. Like the situation you, you described where somebody says, have you ever uh, been in a hospital where you, you, you wanted a better service? I can't remember exactly what it was. But it's designed to get you to, to do something it's not based on the merits of the thing, right? Um, it, and so, so that's the key: is make sure that you um, that you uh, make a differentiation between these things that people give you just to get you obligated to them, versus people who are just open-hearted and want to give you things because they like you or they're that kind of person. They're nice people, you know. And there's a there's a, another thing I talk about in the section on what not to do you know, with reciprocity, and that's when we have given something to someone, and they re they're very uh, grateful and they reply, "So I really appreciate this." And I used to do something where it was a big mistake. I would I'd say, "Oh, don't think anything of it. No big deal. Just you know, you know it wasn't a problem at all. Don't worry about it. Even if I went." above and beyond to make sure they got this thing. I did this favor for them. And then I dismissed it. I just slapped it out the window with the back of my hand. No, the world works better when people who give get something for it. Otherwise they stop giving, right? So what I recommend is that if, if somebody gives you a, a great, a, a, gen, a, a, a generously, a, a, a phrase, thank you, I appreciate this so much, uh, so on, this sort of thing. Um, we put it on the map. We don't dismiss it or diminish it or uh, 
define it away as something else. So I would say, if it's somebody inside your organization, what you say is, oh, I was glad to do it. Um, it's what we do here for one another. So you just set the norm that this is, <laughs> this is what we do, and don't forget the addendum for one another. So that person is now readied. If you need something, this is what we do here for one another. If it's somebody outside of your organization, um, what I what I uh, recommend saying is, oh, of course, I I was glad to do it. I know that if the situation were ever reversed, you'd do the same for me, right? And everybody says, right. <laughs> so now they're waiting <laughs> to have a chance to repay because you've put it on the map. You haven't claimed that it, it, it's nothing to worry about. Oh, no problem, no problem. You've heard that so many times. So often it isn't true, and we have to stay close to uh, reality. What's true? I also come to the, came to this realization. I had stated earlier of using recipro reciprocity to get what you want, but I think another aspect that's really interesting that uh, Buffett and Munger have done is just give, 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 and expect nothing in return. And there's something to that where, one, who doesn't like being surrounded by people that just love uh, helping you uh, in whatever way possible and just giving? And, and also, uh, it attracts all these wonderful people into their lives as a, as a byproduct of that. Yes, yes, that's right. And, and so, so, uh, so often, uh, that's the key. You, you, those those return favors, sometimes larger than the one you gave, right? That's a downstream side effect of giving. It's not the intent. That's just something that flows from, naturally, from it. Nobody loses under those circumstances. I also wanted to mention the liking bias as an investing podcast, uh, it's commonly known that we're likely to buy into a company if we like the the CEO or the face of the organization. And even, even in sales as well, um, we may be offered an inferior product or service, but we want to buy from the person we like. And this could be with a real estate agent, it could be with a financial advisor, it could be really with anything. And the problem is that it might not be in our best interest to make that purchase or invest in that company. And especially with, uh, as investors, we see these, the face of these organizations on in interviews on TV or they're on YouTube or doing a presentation. And these people just generally tend to be really likable people because they rose up the ranks and because they're likable, they rose up to be in that position. And, you know, just because someone is a, is very likable doesn't mean it's a, good investment for us. So when we're listening to someone like this, that's a public CEO, maybe you could talk about what is it about people that makes us like them in the first place? You know, there are two people in uh, national politics who were defined as uh, uh, Teflon. That is, they couldn't do anything wrong in the eyes of uh, people because they were so likable. One was Ronald Reagan. The other was Bill Clinton. Right? They just had this charismatic kind of uh, engaging uh, personality that came across for, one of the, uh, for, for, for them. And they're completely different in terms of their political orientations, but they did have this commonality. And if you look at the way that they talk to people, it revealed the key. They liked the people around them. They were people persons. They liked you. You got the feeling, even in an audience, this person likes me, likes people like me, right? Well, I've been in a lot of sales training programs, and they tell us 
uh, the number one rule of sales is to uh, get your customer to like you. Well, that's very important. I think that's true that it's uh, we we that works. I don't think it's the number one rule. I think the number one rule is come to like your customer, come to like your prospect, come to like your client. And when they see that, when they see that you like them, all kinds of barriers to decision-making come down. So what Reagan and, and, and Clinton had was the ability to project onto others that they like people. They like people. If you're in, he, either of them will like you, you know, if you had a chance to meet them. You know, that was, that I think was the key for me in what those charismatic and, and uh, uniformly um, amiable and likable people do. They project their liking onto you rather than trying to pull it out of you. Right? Uh, both of those work, but I would take the first of those uh, over mm -hmm. uh, the others. And I think there's another interesting dynamic here where uh, with these very well-known people, we're like a lot of times we're just watching them on TV, so they can't personalize their message to you. So is there a difference between, you know, someone just being uh, out in public where they're, they're speaking to a general audience versus um, they're just interacting with you one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, is there anything different when they're speaking in that public sort of format? Well, I mean, they, they try to infuse um, the... Uh, evidence that they are open and approving of you, right? Uh, they, this is the sort of things that, you know, they use humor. That's a very uh, humanizing kind of thing. You see that they tell uh, stories about themselves, self-deprecating stories about themselves. Do you know uh, Guy Kawasaki, who was uh, the, um, uh, the, the commu communication uh, guru, for Apple uh, under Steve Jobs. He was the chief evangelist for Apple. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, as I said, I, I, I do public speaking and we were on the same dais with one another. We were uh, speakers at the same conference. Uh, it was an international conference. It was in Bucharest, R Romania. And, uh, and he had a problem, which was that in his presentation, he had to be very self promote or it's seemingly self-promoting that is he he had to talk about how he and jobs came up with brilliant ideas i mean seismic changes in producing the success that apple had and uh that causes people to sort of move away from you if they see you as a braggart always being a a broker of information positive information about yourself you start to lose credibility in their eyes. Well, he did something um, at the outset of his talk that punctured that sense of uh, self-aggrandizement. Right? Uh, he did some. He did a piece of self-deprecatory uh, humor. Uh, he was saying to the audience. So I was on the phone to my wife last night and telling her about this uh, conference and how I'm on this, the same uh, dais as people like Cialdini and people like uh, Harari, you know. And he, he said, did, did you ever in your wildest dreams picture me in the same places as, the, as those guys? She said to me, Guy? You're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so, so he, <laughs> so everybody laughed and they said, and now he was able to go on and present positive information about himself and what he had done at Apple without getting the, the, uh, the reputation as a self aggrandizer. No, he, he started out by puncturing him, himself, uh, you know, his, his ego. That was brilliant. Yeah. 
And I think in trying to overcome something like this, we want to simply look at the facts and look at, you know, what it is we're actually uh, trying to get, uh, you know, in the example of an investment, we want to look at the company for what they've actually done and, and uh, how great of a company they actually are rather than how much we like the CEO. Is there, is there anything else to overcoming the liking bias? Well, yeah, I think first of all, by the way, that's not just, uh, for the CEO and uh, 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 investor. It turns out there was a study done in India that auditors who like the CEO give them a freer ride in the audit in, in, in the audits. If you're of this uh, from the same region of India or the same religion, right? They get softer audits because of those factors associated with well, with liking right so the for me the general rule is let's say you're buying a car and you really come to like this salesperson uh and um after half an hour 40 minutes you're, you're ready to buy the car you have to ask yourself do i like this person more then is justified for being with him for 40 minutes. Is, is, that, is that real or is it the, the fact that he gave me um, a soft drink, that he told me that uh, he was born in the same er, uh, uh, area as uh, my, my wife grew up or that uh, he complimented the, uh, the, the car that I, my, my, uh, my trade-in uh, and the good uh, choice of the upholstery and colors and so on, whatever. You have to separate the salesperson from the thing he or she is selling and focus on the merits of the thing rather than the communicator who delivered those things. That liking is shouldn't be part of that decision because you're driving the automobile <laughs> off the lot, not the salesperson he or she is staying there that's you're getting the car yeah. so that's the uh, the strategy i would use to step back from that situation and separate those two uh elements wonderful well uh robert dr cialdini i really really appreciate you joining me on the show i want to give you a chance to give a handoff to the audience to how they can get connected with you and uh, it was brought to my attention. You recently launched the Cialdini Institute. So uh, please uh, talk a little bit about that as well. Well, it's um, an online on-demand uh, educational program that informs people of how to be uh, successful and ethical in persuading others in uh, their direction. Anybody who is interested in it, um, can just go to cialdini.com and we'll, you'll come to our website and see what the program is like, what the various options are for um, interacting with us. Uh, and um, yeah, the, so we, uh, we, we have four pillars in that. Everything we say has to be research-based. Everything we say has to be ethically uh, commendable. Everything we has, have to say has to be applicable so we don't just provide a college course but we how do you apply this knowledge about ethical influence now that you know it and then finally we have something new called the small big how to be efficient in applying this what are the smallest changes you can make to your persuasive approach that produce the biggest impact on your persuasive success so those are the, the elements that we try to build in to all our programs. Wonderful. Well, of all the books on my shelf, uh, your book is definitely uh, one of my favorites. I continually revisit and occasionally uh, have it by my bedside and uh, check it out before I uh, lay to rest. And it's no wonder on the front cover, there's the Charlie Munger quote. It says, this is the book that I give most often as a present and is my top recommendation. So if that's not enough of a, of a endorsement. I don't know. I don't know what is. So also, I, I also wanted to mention that, uh, 
many people in our audience will be in Omaha. So I'm curious if you could share if you'll be attending and uh, what that might look like, because to my knowledge, there's some sort of uh, association with you and Berkshire Hathaway. Yes, we, we, we go every year and, uh, you know, we, there's a bookstore, uh, there, uh, in the, uh, auditorium and, uh, you have to be accepted. You have to be nominated by Charlie or Warren and we'll be there again. Uh, so, uh, if people would like to say hello, we'll be at the Berkey bookstore. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Robert. I really appreciate the opportunity. I enjoyed it. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. Link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. We don't know what is going to change in the future in terms of when's the next recession, what's the next big technology, who's going to win the next election. We've never been able to get those right. But the behaviors that have always been enduring and always been with us, regardless of what happens in the future, regardless of what is the next technology or the next recession, we know how people are going to respond to it regardless of what it is.